In this video, we're going to go over reactions associated with ketones and aldehydes. So let's begin with the reduction reaction of ketones and aldehydes. So if you react a ketone or an aldehyde with sodium borohydride followed by H3O+, what do you think is going to happen in this reaction? NABH4 can reduce a ketone or an aldehyde into an alcohol. In this case, you're going to get a secondary alcohol. Now lithium aluminum hydride will have the same effect. So let's say if we react an aldehyde with lithium aluminum hydride, the end result will still be the same. And that is the carbonyl group will be reduced to an alcohol. So in this case, we have a primary alcohol. Now let's go over the mechanism of the first reaction. So here we have a ketone and we're going to react it with sodium borohydride. So the sodium ion has a positive charge and boron has a negative formal charge because it's attached to four hydrogen atoms. And hydrogen is more electronegative than boron. So if you focus on the boron-hydrogen bond, boron has an electronegativity value of approximately 2.0, and for hydrogen is 2.1. So therefore, hydrogen is slightly more electronegative than boron. Therefore, it has a partial negative charge. Now the carbon atom of the carbonyl group contains a partial positive charge. And so this hydride ion where this hydrogen with a negative partial charge is attracted to the carbonyl carbon, so it attacks it. And this is going to give us an alkoxide ion, which has three lone pairs and a negative charge. And so far, we added a hydrogen to the carbonyl carbon. Now, in the second step, we are going to react the alkoxide ion with H3O+. And so it's going to pick up a hydrogen, turn in into a secondary alcohol. And so that is the mechanism for this reaction. Now let's go over some other reactions. So here we have an ester. And let's react it with lithium aluminum hydride. Sodium borohydride is not strong enough to reduce esters and carboxylic acids. But lithium aluminum hydride can reduce them all. So go ahead and predict the major product for that reaction, as well as this one too. So let's say if we have an acid chloride, and if we react it with sodium borohydride with H3O+. Acid chlorides are very reactive, and so we can use a mild reducing agent like sodium borohydride to reduce the acid chloride. Esters are less reactive than acid chloride, so if you mix an ester with sodium borohydride, nothing's going to happen. This is not strong enough to reduce an ester or carboxylic acid. Now let's see what's going to happen if we take this acid chloride and react it with this reagent. So lithium, aluminum with three OR groups and a hydrogen, followed by H3O plus. Now what you need to know is that lithium aluminum hydride will reduce the carbonyl group into an OH group or alcohol functional group. Now this bond will break and so here we have our OH group. I'm going to put that in a different color. And this group here is basically the leaving group. It's going to pick up a hydrogen from the acidified solution turn it into methyl alcohol. But the major product for this reaction will be the primary alcohol. Now sodium borohydride when you react it with an acid chloride it's going to turn into an alcohol as well. So this carbonyl group like this one will be reduced into an alcohol. And the chloride ion will leave as a side product.
Now, if you see lithium aluminum hydride, but instead of having four hydrogens, it only has one, it can only reduce the acid chloride to an aldehyde level. Another reagent that can do this is, if you see it, dibol. Sometimes you'll see an H attached to it. So if you see dibol, it can convert the acid chloride into an aldehyde as well. So now let's go over the mechanism for the reduction of an acid chloride into an alcohol. So here is our acid chloride. And we're going to react it with sodium borohydride. So let's not worry about the sodium ion because it's a spectator ion in this reaction. The boron atom has a negative formal charge, but it has a positive partial charge because it's less electronegative than hydrogen. So don't let that confuse you. Formal charge and partial charge are not the same thing. So the hydride ion, just like before, will attack the carbonyl carbon, causing a pi bond to break. And so we're going to get this tetrahedral intermediate. And right now, the oxygen atom has three lone pairs instead of two. And so this tetrahedral intermediate is unstable. So it collapses, reforming the pi bond, but expelling the chloride ion since it's a good leaving group. And so by adding the first hydrogen, we can go down from the acid chloride to the aldehyde level. But now sodium borohydride will react again with the aldehyde. So we're going to use the second borohydride ion. It's going to attack the carbonyl carbon, generating an alkoxide ion. So far, we've added two hydride ions to the carbonyl carbon. And now the last step is reacting the alkoxide ion with H3O+. So we need to acidify the solution. And so the oxygen with a negative charge is going to pick up a hydrogen, giving us a primary alcohol. So these are the two nucleophilic hydrogen, excuse me, these are the two nucleophilic hydrogen atoms that we've added to the carbonyl carbon. And so whenever you react an acid chloride with sodium borohydride or even lithium aluminum hydride, it's going to reduce the acid chloride all the way down to an alcohol. Now, let's react the acid chloride with lithium. I mean, not just lithium, but lithium aluminum hydride, or at least a deactivated version of it. So instead of aluminum hydride, where it has four hydrogen atoms, we're going to use the one where it has like three OR groups. So this is lithium aluminum OR3 with a hydrogen. And so this is a deactivated reagent. Because it only has one hydrogen, it's going to react with the acid chloride and stop it at the aldehyde level. So this hydrogen is going to attack the acid chloride. And so we're going to get this tetrahedral intermediate. And then it's going to kick out the chloride group. So the end result is the aldehyde. So if you, if you react um, one equivalent of this reagent with the acid chloride, the major product will be this, the aldehyde. It stops at this level because there isn't enough hydrogen atoms to reduce it all the way to an aldehyde. And so whenever you see this, where there's three OR groups attached to the aluminum atom and only one hydrogen, it's telling you to stop at the aldehyde level. So if you have a test, just look for the aldehyde functional group as your answer. Now, there's some other reactions that we need to review as well. What's going to happen if we react a carboxylic acid with lithium aluminum hydrogen 
I mean a hydrogen, but lithium aluminum hydride, followed by H2O+. So just like the other reactions, the carbonyl group will be reduced to an alcohol. And then this group is going to leave. It's going to pick up a hydrogen from the solution. But the end result is that it'll leave as water, which we don't really have to worry about. So the final product will be a primary alcohol. Now what if we have, let's say, an amide functional group? What's going to happen if we reduce it with lithium aluminum hydride? What do you think the major product for this reaction will be? In this case, the amide will be reduced to an amine. So the carbonyl group won't be reduced to an alcohol. It's going to be reduced to a CH2 group. And so you're going to get this, a primary amine. Now, for those of you who might be studying for the organic chemistry final exam, I have a video that can help you, and it's on my Patreon page. If you go to patreon.com slash mathsciencetutor, you can access that page. And if you scroll down, there's a lot of other videos I have here too, but let's say if you're taking the first semester of organic chemistry, I have a six-hour video that can help you with that if you decide to become a patron. Now, on YouTube, I have a free two-hour trailer version of this video, but if you want the entire six-hour video, you can access it here or on Vimeo as well. And for those of you who are taking the second semester of organic chemistry, I have an eight-hour video that you can access as well. And there's some other stuff here that you could find too. If you're taking Gen Chem or Physics, I have stuff on that as well. So that's it, just in case you're interested. Now let's go over some other reactions. What's going to happen if we react cyclohexene with hydrogen gas? and palladium over carbon. Now you know that the alkene will be reduced to an alkane by the addition of two hydrogen atoms which are on the same side with respect to each other. Now something similar happens if we react, let's say, a ketone with hydrogen gas, but we're going to use a different catalyst. In this case, the rainy nickel catalyst. So we're going to add a hydrogen on the oxygen and on its carbon. So the end result is that we're going to get an alcohol, which you can represent like this. So here's the hydrogen that was added to the oxygen, and here's the hydrogen that was added to the carbon. So we basically add two hydrogens across this carbonyl group. Now what about an aldehyde? What if we react it with hydrogen gas using the rainy nickel catalyst? The effect will be the same. We're going to add a hydrogen on the oxygen and on the carbon. So we're going to get a primary alcohol. So here's the hydrogen that was added to the oxygen and here is the hydrogen that was added to the carbon, and here is the other hydrogen that was already present, which you can see here. And so basically, you just add two hydrogen atoms across the double bond. And so you get C with an O, the O has an H, and the C has an H. And of course, the C had two other bonds. So based on that example, let's say if we have an imine, and we wish to react it with hydrogen gas, with palladium over carbon. What do you think the major product will, of this will be? So we're going to add a hydrogen across the double bond. So one on the carbon, one on the nitrogen. So now the nitrogen has a total of two hydrogen atoms. 
and the carbon also has the hydrogen. So the end result is that the imine has been reduced to an amine. Now what if we have, let's say, a nitrile? What's going to happen if we react the nitrile with hydrogen gas? Now we need two equivalents of hydrogen gas. Well, once you add the first equivalent of hydrogen gas to a nitrile, the triple bond will go down to the double bond level. And we're going to add a hydrogen across that triple bond. So one at the carbon and one at the nitrogen. So that's when the first equivalent of H2 reacts with the triple bond. So then once we react it again with another hydrogen gas, the triple bond will now go down, I mean the double bond will go down to a single bond. And so we're going to get an extra pair of hydrogen atoms across that CN bond. And so the net effect of using hydrogen gas with the rainy nickel catalyst is we convert the nitrile into a primary amine. And so that is the net effect. So that is the reduction of a nitrile into an amine. Now let's talk about the reaction of aldehydes with Grignard reagents. What's going to happen if we react butanol with methyl magnesium bromide followed by H3O plus? What do you think the major product will be? Whenever you have a carbon atom bonded to a metal, that carbon is nucleophilic. And so it will attack the partially positive carbon of a carbonyl group. So right now we're going to get an alkoxide ion with a methyl group added to it. And then in the next step, we can react it with H3O+. And so the Grignard reagent can convert an aldehyde or ketone into an alcohol. In the case of this aldehyde, we have a secondary alcohol. Now, what type of alcohol do you think we'll get if we react the Grignard reagent with a ketone? Well, let's find out. So let's say we have cyclopentanone, and we're going to react it with ethyl magnesium bromide followed by H3O+. So the ethyl group will attack the carbonyl carbon. And so we're going to get an alkoxide ion that looks like this with an ethyl group attached to it. And then in the last step, we are going to protonate the alkoxide ion. And so as you can see, the end result is a tertiary alcohol. So the Grignard reagent is useful for converting aldehydes and ketones into alcohols by the addition of an R group, such as an ethyl group, a methyl group, or so forth, whereas sodium borohydride, NaBH4, and lithium aluminum hydride, they can reduce an aldehyde or ketone into alcohols by the addition of a hydride ion. Now let's look at another type of reaction. What's going to happen if we have a ketone and if we react it, let's say, with a primary amine under mild acidic conditions? So to draw your product, what you need to do is remove H2O and then connect the remaining pieces together. So you're going to get something called an imine. If you react it with ammonia, you'll also get an imine. The key is that there has to be two or more hydrogen atoms on the nitrogen atom to get an imine. 
if you have one hydrogen or the nitrogen, let's say if you react the ketone with a secondary amine, you're going to get something else. So here is a secondary amine. Let's use a different ketone this time. So instead of getting a double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen, we're going to get a single bond. But we're also going to get a double bond between two carbon atoms. So we have an, an amine and an alkene. So collectively, this is called an enamine or enamine. So that's what you're going to get if you react a secondary amine with a ketone. You get an enamine. Now let's go over the mechanism for the formation of an imine. So I'm going to take a ketone and I'm going to react it with NH3. By the way, all the steps of this reaction, they're reversible. So ammonia is going to attack the carbonyl carbon, giving us an intermediate that looks like this. So right now the nitrogen atom has a positive formal charge. And then the oxygen is going to accept a proton from the solution. This represents an acid. The acid could be NH4+, plus. it could be H3O+, plus if we're using water as a solvent. So it's just a, a generic way of expressing an acid. So the oxygen with a negative charge will take a hydrogen from a weak acid, turn it into an OH group. Now the weak acid is now a weak base because it lost the hydrogen. And so that base is going to take a hydrogen from the nitrogen atom. And so at this point, what we have is called a carbonyl amine. In the last step, we saw the base took the hydrogen. And so now it's back in its acidic form. And so the OH group is going to accept a proton, turn it into a good leaving group. And so this is what we now have. Now the nitrogen atom is going to use this lone pair to form a pi bond, expel in water, since it's now a good leaving group. And so at this point, what we have is a protonated imine. So the nitrogen atom has a positive charge. And then we could use the base in a solution to take off a hydrogen atom from the nitrogen atom. And now we have our imine final product. And so that's one way in which you can propose a mechanism for the formation of an imine from a ketone. So now, let's go over the formation of the enamine from a ketone. So we're going to react it with a secondary amine, which will look like this. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the nitrogen is going to attack the carbonyl carbon just like before. And the conditions is mildly acidic. And right now we're going to have a nitrogen atom with those four carbons. It doesn't have a lone pair anymore. It has a hydrogen. And we have an oxygen with a negative charge. But the nitrogen now has the positive formal charge. And so in the next step, what we're going to do is react it with a weak acid. We need to add a hydrogen to the oxygen. And so now we have an OH group. We still have the nitrogen with a positive formal charge. The mechanism for the formation of an imine is very similar for the mechanism for the formation of an enamine, at least in the beginning. But towards the end, it's going to differ. 
So we need to use a base to take off the hydrogen. And so now we have this. We have our OH group and the nitrogen with a lone pair at this time. So now that the base took a hydrogen, it's back in its acidic form. And so the oxygen is going to grab a hydrogen. And every step in this reaction is reversible, so just keep that in mind. And now we have a good leaving group. So once you have the good leaving group, in this case H2O, use the lone pair on the nitrogen atom to expel water from this intermediate. So now we have a double bond between the carbon atom and the nitrogen atom. And I'm running out of space here. So now there's a positive formal charge on the nitrogen atom. Now in the next step, we need to form a carbon-carbon double bond. And let's say we have an extra carbon atom. There's two hydrogen atoms that the base can remove. Let me make this a blue hydrogen atom. It can take a blue hydrogen atom or it can take the white hydrogen atom. And so if it takes the blue hydrogen atom, we can form a double bond here, a less stable alkene. Or if it takes the white hydrogen atom, we could form a more stable alkene. And so the base is going to go for the white hydrogen atom because it leads to the more stable product. So keep that in mind if you have an unsymmetrical ketone the more stable enamine will be formed. So we're just going to take off this hydrogen, and we could use uh, this base that was just formed in the last step. So it's going to grab the hydrogen. The carbon-hydrogen bond will break, forming a pi bond, breaking this pi bond in the process. And so now we have the enamine. which looks like this. And so that is the mechanism for the formation of an enamine from a ketone. Next, we're going to discuss a reaction called reductive amination. And basically, it converts ketones into amines. So first, we're going to react with ammonia. And this is going to give us an imine. So Water is a side product. You need to take away the oxygen and two hydrogen atoms from the nitrogen atom, which leaves behind one hydrogen atom. And so now we have the imine product. And then we could reduce the imine using hydrogen and palladium over carbon into an amine. And so that process, the conversion of a ketone into an amine, is reductive amination. So here's another example. Let's say if we have cyclohexanone, and let's react it with a primary amine under mild acidic conditions. And so let's use methoamine. And so this is going to give us an imine. Now, if you take away water, the two hydrogens and the oxygen, you'll be left with the R group attached to the nitrogen atom. And then we could reduce it with sodium cyanoborohydride. And a double bond will be reduced to a single bond, giving us a secondary amine. So next up, we're going to have 2-methylcyclohexanone, and let's react it with a secondary amine under mildly acidic conditions. So we know this is going to give us an enamine. So we're going to have a carbon-nitrogen single bond and a carbon-carbon double bond. So should we put the double bond on the left side or on the right side? The double bond is going to go on the side that makes it more stable, that is with the R group on the left. So now we have the enamine, and then we're going to reduce it with 
sodium cyanoborohydride. And so the double bond will be reduced into a single bond. So the final product for this reaction looks like this. So this time, we have a tertiary amine as opposed to a secondary or primary amine. Now let's talk about the reactivity of aldehydes and ketones. Formaldehyde is more reactive than acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde is more reactive than propanone. So aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. The reason why ketones are less reactive is, for one, you have these bulky CH3 groups, which hinders nucleophilic addition. And also, those CH3 groups are electron donating groups. And so they donate electron density to the electrophilic carbonyl group, making it less electrophilic. And so that's why ketones are less reactive than aldehydes. It's due to the steric effects of the methyl groups and also the fact that they donate electron density to the carbonyl group. Let's say if you were to react formaldehyde with water. Formaldehyde is highly reactive towards water, and so it's going to form a hydrate, which looks like this. And notice that we have a bigger arrow towards the right. Now, if we take acetaldehyde and react it with water, this reaction is fairly reversible, but we can get the hydrate and the aldehyde. Both of them will exist in a solution in relatively equal amounts. Now, the ketone is not really reactive with water. A small amount will convert into the hydrate form, but the majority of it will stay in the ketone form. So ketones are less reactive to water and other nucleophiles than aldehydes. So as you can see, formaldehyde will virtually completely be converted into the hydrate form. Only a very, very small amount will stay in the formaldehyde form. Whereas acetaldehyde, both of these will exist in a significant amount in equilibrium when water is present. And the ketone, it really doesn't want to react with water. Now consider this reaction between an aldehyde and an alcohol instead of water. So let's use methanol. And we need an acid catalyst. So in the first step, we're going to get a hemiacetal which is basically a carbon with an OH group and an OR group. So that's a hemiacetal. And then if we react it with another methanol molecule, we can get an acetal, where we have two OR groups instead of one. Now let's say if we have an acetal, what's going to happen if we react it with HGO plus? With excess water under acidic conditions, you can go back from the acetal group into a ketone. So this reaction is controlled by equilibrium. So if you add water, you're going to go in this direction. But if you add excess alcohol under acidic conditions, you're going to go back to the acetal form. Now let's say we have cyclopentanone and we wish to react it with ethylene glycol. What is the major product of this reaction? So what we're going to get is a protecting group. So we have two alcohol functional groups, but in the same molecule. 
So we're going to get an acetal that looks like this. And it serves to protect the ketone from nucleophiles. Now to get rid of the acetal protecting group, we just need to add HGO+. And this will convert it back into the ketone form. So let's say if we have a molecule that looks like this. So this molecule has a ketone functional group and an ester functional group. What reagents do we need in order to synthesize these three products? Let's say if we want to reduce the ketone but not the ester, how can we do so? What reagent do we need to do that? Or let's say if we want to reduce everything, the ketone and the ester, how can we do that? Or what if we want to reduce the ester, but not the ketone? What reagents do we need to make these three products? So go ahead and feel free to pause the video. Try these examples. So for the first one, we need to use sodium borohydride because this will reduce the ketone into an alcohol, but it's not strong enough to reduce the ester, so the ester will be unaffected. Now, for the second example, we need to use lithium aluminum hydride because it's a strong reducing agent. It will reduce the ketone into an alcohol, and it will reduce the ester into an alcohol. Now, for the last example, we want to reduce the ester, but not the ketone. And so in this case, we need to use a protecting group. So let's go over this reaction. The ketone is more reactive to nucleophiles than the ester. The ester has an electron donating group. And so the lone pairs on the oxygen can form a resonance structure that makes the carbonyl carbon less nucleophilic, as you can see in this form. So it can donate electron density into the carbonyl carbon. So the first thing we need to do is react the ketone with ethylene glycol. And so this will protect the ketone from nucleophilic addition reactions. So now we can reduce the ester with lithium aluminum hydride, turning it into an alcohol, while the acetal group remains unaffected by lithium aluminum hydride. And then we can remove the protected group with H3O+, converting it back into a ketone. And so that's how we can reduce the ester, but not the ketone, by the use of a protecting group. Now, earlier in this video, we mentioned a reaction between a ketone and methanol. And this can give us an acetal, which looks like this. So what if we have a ketone, and let's say we react it with, instead of an alcohol, a thiol under acidic conditions. Well, we're still going to get the OH group. But instead of an OCH3 group, we're going to get an SCH3 group. And then if we add another thiol molecule to this, we can remove the OH group and replace it with another SCH3 group. So adding the thiol will drive the reaction to the right. Add an HVO plus or water with H+, it's going to cause the reaction to go to the left. So we need to add an acid catalyst to go in either direction. Now let's say if we have cyclopentanone, but we wish to add a thiol that looks like this. So we have a molecule that contains two thiol functional groups. 
So we're going to get another type of protecting group that looks like this. But we can do some different stuff with this type of protecting group. For instance, if we react it with hydrogen gas using the rainy nickel catalyst, we can completely get rid of all of the sulfur atoms and replace it with hydrogen atoms. So the net effect is that we converted a ketone into an alkane under mild acidic conditions. Now there are some other ways in which we can reduce a ketone into an alkane. Another reaction is the Clemson reduction reaction, which involves the use of zinc with mercury under acidic conditions, but these conditions are strongly acidic. And so the end result is the conversion of a ketone into an alkane by the addition of two hydrogen atoms. Another similar reaction is the wolf kishner reaction, which occurs under strongly basic conditions. The reagent is hydrazine, H2NNH2, which can be written as N2H4, so you might see it like that. And you need a strong base with heat to make this work. And so the end result is the same. It converts the ketone into an alkane. It completely reduces it into cyclopentane. Another reaction that you need to be familiar with is the reaction of aldehydes with the silver cation. So let's say we react this particular aldehyde with Ag complex with ammonia in a basic solution. Aldehydes are very sensitive to the silver cation and so it's going to be oxidized into a carboxylate ion. Under basic conditions this will be deprotonated but if in the second step you decide to acidify the solution you can convert it into a carboxylic acid. So here's another example. Let's say if we have cyclopentane carbaldehyde and let's react it with silver oxide and water. So in this case the silver is in a plus one oxidation state and so the aldehyde will be converted into a carboxylate ion. In the next reaction we're going to talk about the formation of a cyanohydrin from the reaction of hydrocyanic acid with a ketone. So the carbonyl group will be reduced to an OH group by the addition of a cyanide ion. And so this is a cyanohydrin. Now let's go over the mechanism for that reaction. So in the first step, the ketone reacts with the cyanide ion. And so this is a very strong nucleophile and it attacks the carbonyl carbon, giving us this intermediate. Now this first step is reversible because this oxygen can reform the ketone, expelling the cyanide group. Now in the next step, the oxygen with negative charge is going to take a hydrogen from HCN, regenerating the cyanide ion. And so this is our final product. So we get a cyanohydrin. Now, if we react the cyanohydrin with H3O+, the nitrile will be converted into a carboxylic acid. And so we're going to get a carboxylic acid. We have an OH group on this carbon, and we have a methyl group as well. So let's call this carbon 1, 2, and 3. So the carboxylic acid group is on carbon 1, where the nitrile was. On carbon 2, we have an OH group and we have a methyl group. And then this is going to be carbon 3. So that is an alpha hydroxy carboxylic acid. The hydroxy group is on the alpha carbon. This is the beta carbon.
So next up in our list of stuff to talk about is the Wittig, or rather, the Wittig reaction. So here we have cyclopentanone, and we're going to react this stuff with something called an ilid. Who came up with these names? What's going to happen here? What is going to be the major product in this example? All we need to do is basically replace the oxygen with the CH2 group. And so the Wittig reaction is very useful for uh, converting ketones into alkenes. And so this is going to be the major product. Now let's look at another example. So let's say we have another ketone, a very simple ketone. And we're going to react it with a uh, ilid, but this ilid is going to look a little different than the other one. So we're going to have a hydrogen and a methyl group on this carbon. And so in this form, the phosphorus has a positive formal charge and the carbon has a negative formal charge. So how can we draw the product if the ilid is given to us like that? What I would do is draw the resonance form of this ilid. And so it looks like this. The next thing I would do is basically rotate this ketone such that the double bond O is facing this double bond. And then the next thing I'm going to do is replace the oxygen with this group. And so the product of this reaction is going to look like this. Now let's say we have this particular reactant, acetaldehyde, and let's react it with an ilid that looks like this. So draw the products of this reaction. So the first thing I would do is basically change the orientation of this molecule. And so I'm going to write it like this. And then all we need to do is replace the oxygen of the carbonyl group with what we see here. And so we can get this alkene where the two methyl groups are trans to each other. Now we can also get another type of alkene. For instance, if we replace the CH3 with the hydrogen, if we switch them, then the two CH3s could be on the same side. And so we can get the other isomer. And so you can get a mixture of isomers for the Wittig reaction. And so this is the other product. Now let's go over the mechanism of the Wittig reaction. So the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to have triphenylphosphine and it's going to react with an alkyl halide in an SN2 reaction. So because this is an SN2 reaction, Primary alcohol halides will work very well. Tertiary alcohol halides will not work. Secondary is like, hmm, you got to be careful with those. But ideally, you want to use a primary alcohol halide. And so what's going to happen is the phosphorus atom is going to be attached to this carbon. And that carbon has two hydrogens right now. And it also has a CH3 group. Now, whenever phosphorus, like nitrogen, has four bonds, it's going to have a positive formal charge. Now, in the next step, what we need to do is react this with butyl lithium. Whenever a carbon is bonded to a metal, that carbon is nucleophilic. And it's a strong base. So what it's going to do is it's going to take off the hydrogen, put in a negative charge on this carbon. And so we have a resonance form 
of the ILID. And so here is the other resonance form. So you can write it in any one of these two ways. So now let's see how the ILID is going to react with a ketone. So I'm going to use this form of the ILID where the carbon has a negative formal charge. Now you want to set it up like this because the nucleophilic carbon with the negative charge is attracted to the partially positive carbonyl carbon. And the phosphorus, which has a positive formal charge, is attracted to the oxygen with its negative partial charge. So the nucleophilic carbon will attack the carbonyl carbon, causing a pi bonds break. And those pi electrons will be used to connect the oxygen and the phosphorus together. And so you're going to get this four-membered ring that looks like this. So I'm going to draw this carbon atom. So we have a carbon and another carbon, and a single bond between a carbon and the oxygen. And now the oxygen is attached to the phosphorus group. And so here's the two R groups of the electrophilic carbon. And here's the hydrogen and the methyl of the nucleophilic carbon. And here's the three phenyl groups. Now, these two bonds will break. So let's talk about this bond first, the bond between the carbon and the phosphorus atom. Which of these two atoms is more electronegative, carbon or phosphorus? It turns out that carbon is more electronegative than phosphorus. And you can look this up online. If you type in electronegativity table in Google Images, you can uh, verify that. So because carbon is more electronegative, when this bond breaks, carbon is going to pull those electrons toward itself. So those electrons will go here as opposed to going here. So they're going to go towards the more electronegative carbon. Likewise, when this bond breaks, it's going to go, those electrons are going to go towards the more electronegative oxygen atom because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And so whenever a bond breaks, those electrons will tend to go towards the more electronegative atom. And so at this point, when this oxophosphatine group breaks apart, we're going to get an alkene, which in this case looks like this. And the other side product will be triphenyl phosphine oxide. And so that's the mechanism for the Wittig reaction. And so that's it. Now let's talk about the Bayer Villager oxidation reaction. And so we're going to react a ketone with a proxy acid. And in order to draw the product of this reaction, all we need to do is insert an oxygen either between R1 and the carbonyl carbon or between R2 and the carbonyl carbon. So the product could look like this or it can be like this. The side product is a carboxylic acid. So basically an oxygen is transferred from the proxy acid to the ketone, turn it into an ester. And so the proxy acid becomes a carboxylic acid as it loses an oxygen atom. Now, how can we determine which R group is going to have the oxygen? Is it going to be R1 or R2? So we need to determine which R group has a greater migratory aptitude. And it turns out that hydrogen has a greater migratory aptitude than a tertiary alcohol, I mean not alcohol, but a tertiary alkyl group, and that's higher than a secondary alkyl group, which has the same migratory aptitude as a phenyl group, and that's better than 
a primary alkyl group, which is better than a methyl group. And so let's go over some examples. Let's start with acetaldehyde. So what is the major product of this reaction? So let's write both possibilities. We can insert the oxygen between the carbon and the methyl group, or between the carbonyl carbon and the hydrogen group. So this is one possibility. And here is the other possibility. So which of these two answers is the major product? Hydrogen has a greater migratory aptitude than the methyl group. So therefore, this is going to be the major product. So whenever you use a peroxy acid on an aldehyde, it's going to be oxidized to a carboxylic acid. Now let's work on some practice problems. Go ahead and react propanone with a proxy acid and predict the major product. Also, we're going to use cyclopentanone as well. So go ahead and try these reactions. Now, both of these ketones are symmetrical, and so it really doesn't matter where we put the oxygen atom. So I'm just going to put it on the right side. Therefore, the Bayer-Villager oxidation reaction is very useful for converting ketones into esters. Now, in the case of a cyclic ketone, we're going to get a lactone. So we started with a 5-membered ring. Now we're going to introduce the oxygen to this ring, so it's going to be a 6-membered ring. So this is called a lactone. So here is another example. What is the major product of this reaction? So let's draw both possibilities. We can put the oxygen atom on the left side, or we can put it on the right side. So which of these two products is the correct one? Should we put it on the left or should we put it on the right? So we're comparing a secondary alkyl group. Even though this is a tertiary carbon, when you disconnect it, is considered a secondary alkyl group because you're no longer counting this carbon. So we have a methyl group versus a secondary alkyl group. Now based on what I gave you earlier, we know that hydrogen is the best, then it's the tertiary alkyl group, and then the secondary alkyl group, which is about the same as the phenyl group, and then it's the primary alkyl group, and then the least reactive is the methyl group. So it's definitely not going to be the methyl group. Therefore, we're going to put the oxygen atom with the secondary alkyl group. So this is the answer. Now let's do one last example. So go ahead and predict the major product of this reaction. So we have a methyl group on the left and an isopropyl group on the right. Well, we know the methyl group has the least migratory aptitude, so therefore we need to put the oxygen between the carbonyl carbon and the isopropyl group. And so now you know how to find the major product of the Bayer-Villager oxidation reaction. And as you can see, it converts ketones into esters. Now, there's one more topic that we need to talk about, and it is the direct addition reaction versus the conjugate addition reaction. And so here we have an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, 
as you can see, there's a double bond between the alpha and beta carbons. The alpha carbon is one carbon away from the carbonyl group. The beta carbon is two carbons away from the carbonyl group. And alkenes are unsaturated because they have less hydrogen atoms than alkanes do. Alkanes are fully saturated with hydrogen atoms. Alkenes, they're deficient in hydrogen atoms compared to alkanes. So we have an alpha-beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. Now, it's important to understand that the beta carbon and the carbonyl carbon, they're electrophilic. The nucleophile can attack at the beta carbon or it can attack at the carbonyl carbon. If it attacks at the beta carbon, we have conjugate addition. And if it attacks at the carbonyl carbon, it's known as direct addition. Now the alpha carbon is nucleophilic, and so is the oxygen. So you can show this using resonance structures. So we could take this double bond, move it here, and break the pi bond. If we do so, we're going to have a negative charge on the oxygen atom. And there's a double bond here, and there's a positive charge on the beta carbon. And so thus, you can see that the beta carbon is electrophilic due to the positive formal charge, and the oxygen atom is nucleophilic due to the negative charge on it. Now we can draw another resonance structure. If we take a lone pair, form a pi bond, and push these electrons on this carbon. And so this shows that the alpha carbon is nucleophilic since it has a negative formal charge. Now starting from the original alpha-beta unsaturated compound. We can also draw this resonance structure. And so that shows that the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. Now, it's important to understand that strong bases prefer to attack the carbonyl carbon, whereas weak bases, they prefer to attack the beta carbon. And so weak bases, they favor conjugate addition, whereas a strong base favors direct addition. Now, let's go over some examples. Let's use the Grignard reagent. The Grignard reagent is a very strong base, and so it's going to favor direct addition. So therefore, it's going to go to the carbonyl carbon. And so the final product will look like this. We're going to get an OH group, and we're going to add the methyl group to the carbonyl carbon. And so the double bond will be unaffected. Now let's use a weak base. A good example is the cyanide ion. It's a good nucleophile, but it's a weak base. And so weak bases tend to go for the beta carbon. And so they favor conjugate addition. So the CN group will be here. So this is conjugate addition. And above, we have direct addition. So keep in mind, strong bases, they favor direct addition. And weak bases favor conjugate addition. Here's another example. So what about the Gilman reagent? 
So let's say we have this organocopper lithium reagent. Is it considered a strong base or a weak base? With the Gilman reagent, it's going to go for the beta carbon. So it's not as strong as the Grinner reagent. Therefore, we're going to get this product. So that's how we can put a methyl group on the beta carbon using the Gilman reagent. Here's another example. Let's say if we use sodium borohydride with this molecule. This reagent can produce a mixture of products for this specific type of ketone. So you can get direct addition by adding the hydrogen here. And you can also get conjugate addition with the hydrogen being added at that carbon. And so that reaction gives you a mixture of products. Consider these two compounds. A conjugated ketone and a conjugated aldehyde. Which compound favors direct addition and which one favors conjugate addition? Now the one that favors direct addition is the one that's most accessible. And for the aldehyde, the carbonyl part of the molecule is more accessible towards a direct addition. In the case of the ketone, the methyl group creates steric hindrance, so it's harder for the nucleophile to approach the carbonyl compound. Therefore, aldehydes, they favor direct addition. Aldehydes are more electrophilic than ketones. The methyl group is an electron donating group, and so it donates electron density to the carbonyl functional group, making it less electrophilic. And so ketones, they favor conjugate addition, whereas aldehydes, which are more accessible, favor direct addition. So even if you have, let's say, a Grinner reagent, which favors direct addition, if, if the ketone is sterically hindered, the Grinner reagent, which favors direct addition, may have no choice but to attack at the beta carbon, given the conjugate addition product. So even with greener reagents, you can increase the yield of the conjugate addition product by making the carbonyl part of the molecule less accessible. So you need to consider two factors, the strength of the base and any steric hindrance. So strong bases like a greener reagent, they favor direct addition. Weak bases favor conjugate addition. Ketones they favor conjugate addition, and aldehydes favor direct addition. So let me give you an example problem. So here we have two ketones. So looking at the ketone on the left, that ketone, does it favor direct addition or conjugate addition? Now this nucleophile is going to have a hard time accessing this carbonyl group, and so it's not going to go there. But notice that the beta carbon is more accessible. So this particular ketone, it's going to favor conjugate addition over direct addition because the nucleophile it can't get past these terbutyl groups to basically do direct addition. So the carbonyl group is inaccessible therefore the nucleophile is going to favor conjugate addition. So ketones may perform conjugate addition 
in addition to direct addition. Now looking at this example here, notice that the beta carbon is blocked by these terbutyl groups, so it's inaccessible. Therefore, the nucleophile has an easier time attacking the carbonyl group. And so it's going to favor direct addition over conjugate addition. And so you need to consider steric factors as well as the strength of the base to see which of these two pathways will lead to the major product. So now let's go over the mechanism of the direct addition reaction. So the first thing we're going to do is react it with a strong base. Now in this case both the beta carbon and the carbonyl carbon they're relatively accessible to the Grignard reagent. So the strength of the base will determine which one is going to lead to the major product. So because we have a strong base and none of these carbons are sterically hindered, then the Grignard reagent is going to attack the carbonyl carbon. And so we're going to get an oxygen with a negative charge. And then in the next step, we can use the solvent which could be ethanol or something else to protonate the oxygen. And so that's the mechanism for the direct addition reaction. Now let's go over the mechanism for the conjugate addition reaction. So in this case, I'm going to use cyanide. So cyanide is going to attack the beta carbon because it's a weak base. The pi bond will break. And so we're going to get an oxygen atom with a negative charge. And we have a double bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alpha carbon. And here is the CN group. Now in the next step, we need to add a hydrogen to the alpha carbon. Keep in mind the alpha carbon is nucleophilic. So when the oxygen with a negative charge uses one of its lone pairs to reform the pi bond, this double bond will break, acquiring a hydrogen atom. So here's the CN group. Here's the hydrogen that we added to the alpha carbon, which we don't need to show that. And so we can just write the final product like this the net result is that we've added a nucleophile to the beta carbon. And so that's the mechanism for the conjugate addition reaction.